Then you have told us in your word, if the people that are called by my name shall assemble themselves together and pray, then I'll hear from heaven. What a promise. Then we are just as sure that we are standing in the Angelus Temple here at Echo Park. We're just that sure that God hears and more sure because it's his word. And we know that you'll answer. And we pray, Lord, that all that's in divine presence tonight with the speaker may be blessed with the presence of the Holy Ghost. May he take our lives and mold them and make them and fashion them that we might walk from henceforth according to his will. Bless this temple, its pastors, its teachers, and all that of its members, and may it just continue to grow and to spread with this marvelous gospel. Bless every church that's here tonight, the different denominations around. We pray that you'll be thou near us all, for we need you, Father. Bless the word now as we meditate upon it, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I was standing behind the curtain just now and heard Brother Duffield mention that it kind of shocked me to think that after tonight there's only three more services in this campaign. And I, I'm just, we just got all the spooks away now so we can really get right into the gospel. <clears throat> I didn't mean maybe to be that rude about it, saying spooks. I'm not on the air tonight, so I, um, I uh, feel just a little more, you know, around yourself. It's like you feel it's all right out there, but I'm always thinking of where it's going to out there. I like to kindly like look a feller in the face when I'm talking to him, you know, and I feel better about it. Well, we certainly have enjoyed these days. Just talking to my good friend, Brother Duplissus back there, which is leaving us tonight to go further into more services. And he's going into Europe now to set up meetings in different places there for me and down into South Africa and Germany and Switzerland and and then we're anticipating then to Australia right away now. Depends on how, as soon as Mr. Graham gets out, we're waiting for him to get out long enough that it won't look like I just rode right in on his ministry. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be there while he's there. He's taken very good care of the job. I admire Billy Graham. <clears throat> Thank you. It goes to show what he's made out of. When the news said they'd put signs on the street, go back home, Billy Graham, and boot him and everything, he found out he was made out of that kind of goods that don't boo out so easy when the Lord's told him to go. He stayed right with it. And I seen him on television and looked like his eye was all black beneath there and still standing there hammering away. A man has to admire a servant of Christ like that. He certainly do. I think he's doing a gracious job. And he might not believe in divine healing the way we do, and still he might believe the way we do. God's gave him a job to do, so he's doing his part. As long as if I can take care of my end of it, as good as he's taking care of his end, it'll be fine. <laughs> I'll feel real good about it. So God bless him is my prayer. Now, we've been speaking on Abraham. And just kind of hitting the highlights, the, just uh, what we would call the high points. And I just only wish that I had the opportunity and time now that we could just take that book of Genesis and break them down. We're just touching the high spots of it. If we could go back and pull in those scriptures. I stayed on the book of Revelations one time in my church for three years straight. That's constantly in services. And just breaking the words down and all of the, I'm breaking the text, I mean, 
All of God's word just doves tails rights together. There's no contradiction in his word. And all of it, of the 66 books, there's no contradiction. They all just hit the same place. You can depend on it being inspired. We're so glad to have a, a real God and a real Bible. And a God that stays behind his word and backs up every word he says. I'm so happy to know that. Of course, the other day, you know, I had a birthday. I'm not no little boy no more. And I, I, my, but my anchor, the holes within the veil, that's the main thing. I, I'm so glad of that, that after life is fading away and the, the moisture of the river of Jordan begins to strike me in the face some of these mornings, I don't believe I'll be fearing then. One of these days I'm going to preach my last sermon and close the Bible the last time. And you know what I want to say then when I know I fought my way through the battlegrounds to the end of the road? I, I want to get down to the river and say, send out the lifeboat, Father. I'm coming over home this morning. <laughs> I believe he'll do it. So now, have you enjoyed these lessons on Abraham? Thank you. Now tonight we are going to have the third and last of this because tomorrow night we're going to start healing services again. And if the Lord willing, I want to speak tomorrow night just almost a continuation but on time of decision. And that, of course, comes out of Genesis, the 24th chapter, where I take my text of Rebecca, where she had to make a decision. And um, pray for for these services and tomorrow morning at the Christian full gospel businessman's breakfast at Clifton's. I'm sure you're all invited to come and if you cannot come by some means, turn on the radio because they certainly have a wonderful time there. I've seen some great healings take place down there at that breakfast. Uh, my tape boy here, one of them, Mr. Mercer, his mother had come down from but from her home up in Michigan, I'd never seen the woman. And she was sitting in the meeting, and I knew it not. But he was sitting over there praying for his mother. And if the Holy Spirit didn't come right over and call that woman out right there at the breakfast and heal her of a affliction she'd had for years and years and years. And uh, so we don't know what the Lord will do. He's just everywhere and full of goodness. So happy for it. Now, we want to read uh, just one verse of Scripture. Uh, found in the book of Genesis, the 22nd chapter, and the 14th verse. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Jehovah-Jireh. Now, last night we left our brother in getting in contact with God, one of his angels, just before the destruction of Sodom. And Lot, remember, had took his choice and had went down into Sodom to live in sin and luxury and pleasure. But yet he was a believer. And now, this may have a little bit of a Calvinistic wang to it, but if a man is once a Christian, he may get away from it, but it'll never get away from him. There's something happens to a man. John 5, 14, Jesus said, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath, present tense, eternal life. And shall never come into condemnation, but hath, past tense, pass from death unto life. That's his words. But Lot had backslid. He was going not to lose his soul, but lose his reward. And there he was, to remember, to find out whether he was still had the spark in his heart. We find out that the Bible said that the sins of that people vexed his righteous soul. Don't you feel bad tonight to go out on the street and see people the way they live in sin? 
That's the righteousness of God in your heart. That it just seems there's something wrong. And that's the way Lot was. Though he was had a, a circumstances and had backslidden, but yet down in his heart. And I believe this, that out in many of those great fine churches tonight, great denominational churches, people who has not yet received the Holy Spirit, many, but I believe down in their heart, many of them has a warm feeling towards God and the desiring the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, the main thing is with our message, it's not the message that's hindering, it's the way it's presented sometimes. See, if we can present it right in the power and the demonstration of the love of God, man will be glad to receive it. Now, we found last night that the last message just before Sodom was destroyed, which today, the church of the day, or the world of this day, is suffering under the same sins that Sodom was destroyed for. And I've said this, and I do not hope it sounds sacrilegious, but if God lets the United States get by with its sinning without having judgment, he'll be duty-bound as a righteous God to resurrect Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize for sinking them or burning them up. Because they are doing the same sins. And I noticed in this fair city here, especially on the perversion, homosexuals, it's on the increase. I read a paper not long ago how many each year it multiplies. Oh, oh that was the sins of Sodom. One of them. Worldliness. Lust. And it's terrible to see it. And not only this city in this country, but world over. It seems like that something has happened. Mental slip has come to people. And now, before that great cities was destroyed, God sent an angel, two of them, and came himself in the form of a man and sat down and eat meat and bread and butter and drank milk. Not a, a spirit, but a man. And he was none other than Jehovah God himself. Showing by an example that just before the end time, God always appears in the form of man flesh to preach the gospel just before the end of the Jews God was made manifest in a human body called Jesus which was the son of God but God dwelt in his son God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself or expressing himself through the lips of Christ his son I was his son because he overshadowed Mary and created a blood cell. The, ma the baby is born by the blood cell which comes from the male, not the female. The female, the cell of the female is only the egg. The germ of life comes from the male. Just like a hen can lay an egg or a bird. It's coming springtime and all the birds go out and make their nest. And they, uh, lay, a mother bird can lay a nest full of eggs and get over them eggs and hover over them. She turns them with her feet, keeps them warm, and she can sit on that nest and hover those eggs until she's so poor and weak she can't fly off of that nest. But if she hasn't been with the male bird, they'll never hatch. That's right. She's got to be in contact with the male because the hen can lay the egg or the bird can lay the egg but if it hasn't been with the male it's not fertile and that's the way some churches we just get a bunch of members in there and baby them and pat them and 
and so forth and, and baby them till you take all the spirit out of the church and you haven't got nothing but a nest full of rotten eggs. That's exactly the truth. There's only one thing to do is clean out the nest and start over again. What we need tonight is a good old-fashioned St. Paul's revival and the Bible, Holy Ghost, back in the church. How could you ever take a people like that that's never been in contact with the male, which is Christ, and teach to them divine healing while they've never been in contact with anything? They don't know nothing about it. How can you teach them the baptism of the Holy Ghost? What happens to them eggs? They lay right in the nest and rot. No matter what you do to them, they'll rot because they're not fertile. And any church that's not fertile, that is from the fertility of the coming of the Holy Spirit into the human heart, no matter how good a church it is, how well the members dress, how educated the pastor is, how finer songs you got, what a fine building you got, if Christ isn't there, the Spirit of God isn't there, you've got nothing but the same unfertile bunch of eggs. That's exactly. And you'll never get anywhere with them. What we need tonight is a Holy Spirit back in the church, moving in every member, setting it in order. Now, Lot was backslidden, but God came down to Abraham and performed a mighty miracle. And then when he performed this miracle, Abraham called him Elohim, the great mighty Jehovah. But he was a man sitting there eating Drinking, talking, a stranger. And remember, being a stranger, he yet asked, Where is Sarah thy wife? Same spirit came in the body of Jesus Christ and said, Thou art Simon. You, your father is Jonas. I saw thee when thou was under the fig tree to Philip. Go get your husband and come here. I have no husband. Thou hast said, well, for you have five husbands. And the one you're now living with is not your husband. That same Spirit of God. And we find out that Jesus, picking that up. Now, you know, the Bible is wrote on pages. But yet, you have to have the Spirit of God to understand the Scripture. It's a love letter to the believer. A man can get down and set it. No wonder they say that, oh, there, it contradicts itself. I've offered any price that I can pay for anyone who can show me a contradiction in the Bible. It's not there. No, sir. It says you're contradicted in your own heart and mind. God doesn't contradict himself. Not one place it can be straightened with the Word of God if it's put together. But it's all confused to you because... Jesus thanked the Father that he had hid this from the eyes of the wise and prudent and revealed it to babes such as would learn. When I go overseas, I got a lovely wife. And I tell her now, uh, goodbye, sweetheart. You pray for me now. She prays for me. When I'm overseas and gone for months and I pick up a letter, she'll say, Dear Billy, I am sitting here tonight with the children thinking much of you. Now, I see what she's writing on the paper, but you see, I love her so much till I, I can read between the lines. I know what she's talking about, see? And that's the way it is with God. You can't just sit down and read it in a cold, formal heart. You've got to be in love with the author, and then you can read between the lines. Then you, you have an understanding of the Scriptures. Now, Jesus is saying that to those Jews, see, when he revealed himself. Then he said, prophesied to the coming of the end of time, for these signs have never been done before the Gentiles. And he said that as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Same thing. And then if you notice, when he said about Noah, he gave some morals that they were doing, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, and so forth. But in Sodom's time, the great angel had come and revealed it. Then we find we left Abraham returning to his tent last night after the angel or God had left him. The angels went on, two of them went down into Sodom. And we know what happened down there. Then we find 
Coming on after that, the destruction of Sodom, God raining fire and brimstone out of the heavens and destroying Sodom. Now, I want you to notice, though, before one bit of fire ever struck Sodom, Lot and the sleeping bride, as we would refer to it today, come, uh, the sleeping virgin, come out of Sodom. Come out. Then the fire fell. He said, hasten hither quickly, for I can do nothing till thou hast come thence. Come out. The call of the church today is, come out of Sodom. Come out of it. Then the fire fell. And we find Abraham then and Sarah, real old people. Abraham was 100 years old. And Sarah was 90. Now, as I expressed a few moments ago about reading between the lines, but if you're reading between the lines and try to make it say something that in between the lines says something different than what the line says, then it's wrong. But it's got to agree all the way through it. The Bible is just like a great jigsaw puzzle, if you excuse the expression. And if you just try to put it together just the way you look at it, You've got to have something over here to look at. If you don't, you ruin your scene. You'll have a cow picking grass on top of a tree. So it won't be right. So that's the way it is with when you try to put the Bible together with an intellectual understanding of it. You can't do it. It's a spirit-written word. And it takes the Holy Spirit to place it together. Then you get the whole great picture from Eden out into Chaos and the way of the cross back home. That's the entire picture. God's redemption story of sending His own Son to redeem a lost and polluted people. Now, Sarah was 90 years old. And Abraham was 100 years old. Here they are, the Bible said, they were both well stricken in age. At 90 years old, that would make her about 45 years past menopause. But this angel that spoke to Sarah, or spoke to Abraham, gave Abraham this promise that according to the time of life, otherwise next month, according to the time of life, as it would be with Sarah, I'm going to visit you. That was his promise. God keeps his promise. Now, they'd had a, a baby by Hagar. And Hagar had, of course, later on had to take her baby and have it cast out. She and her baby. For the bondswoman and her child will not be heir with the free woman and her child. I want you to notice a little story here. When Hagar, how she must have thought the misbehavior of Sarah and of Abraham, that lovely couple, they had lived together, the sweethearts of the Old Testament. And all of a sudden, uh, the attitude of Sarah changed and Abraham did not want to cast his child away. But the Lord spoke to Abraham and said, do as Sarah has said. Then Hagar, how she must have felt that morning when she took her baby, a son of Abraham, and a bottle of water. And a little basket of bread on top of her head, that young uh, Egyptian woman, and went out into the wilderness, and the water was all spent, and the baby started crying for water. And she took the little fellow and put him under a bush, and went a bow shot, 150 yards or something, and knelt down and began to cry. She couldn't stand to hear the baby crying for water and dying in that condition. But remember, the Bible said that the Lord heard the child. Why? He's the seed of Abraham. God hears the cry of the children of Abraham. And if you're in Christ tonight, you are Abraham's seed. He never heard Hagar, his, his, the woman, the mother. She's very religious, but he never heard her. The covenant wasn't with that. It was with Abraham's seed. Oh, if I could get that 
drilled into you. God's obligated. He swore by himself and made the covenant unconditionally between Abraham and his seed forever. You are Abraham's seed if you are Christ. If you are dead in Christ, you are Abraham's seed and are heirs according to the promise. And the same promise that he made Abraham is yours. Oh, that ought to make everybody get well. To think that if you are the seed of Abraham. Now, I see he never heard Hagar crying, but the scripture said he heard the cry of the child. And he told Hagar he had heard the child crying in misery and want before he heard Hagar praying. That selected, elected, chosen people that the real Christian is, and then to see that Satan will get into their intellectuals and cause them to suffer and be taught that the promise was some other age, when it's all of Abraham's children has that promise. Would you give your little girl a glass of water and give the next little girl of yours a glass of milk if they were both starving and you had milk to give? Would you give one a rock and the other a serpent, said Jesus? As long as you are Abraham's children, God swore that he had confirmed this covenant with you. You are his children and you have a right to these things. This is God's blessings, the redemption blessings, the, that Christ redeemed you from these curses. And they're your privileges to have. I don't understand how any person could preach the gospel without including divine healing because sickness is an attribute of sin. Before we had any sickness, we had no sin. When sin came, then sickness followed with it. Might not be your, your sins. You inherit these things down as God promised to three and four generations. But yet the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. If a big uh, animal had me, his foot in my side and was cutting me in with his paw, there's no need of trying to cut his paw off. Just kill the animal from the head and it kills paw and all. So you don't have to pick out divine healing or any other redemptive blessings. When you knock sin in the head, you knock the whole thing in the head. You kill it all. For that's the first cause. And when that's ridded, every attribute goes with it. Now, Abraham then, being old, God met him just exactly the way he said he would meet him. Now, I want you to notice. Now, Bible students, and I know I'm in a great school here. Now, if you don't agree with this, you do just like I do when I eat cherry pie. Uh, when I'm eating cherry pie or chicken, and I run into a bone or seed, I never throw away the pie or chicken. I just throw away the bone or the seed and keep on eating chicken or pie. So that's the way you do with it. If you do not believe it, all right, that's up to you. Just let that be a bone. But the part that you believe, you eat. You see. Now, God showed right here. Now, I'm going in between the lines just for a minute. And watch if this weaves out right. God showed right here what he's going to do to every son and daughter of Abraham. Everyone. Now, we know that that woman being 90 years old, little grandma with a little dust cap and a little shawl over her shoulders and all stooped shoulder, and Abraham with great long beard and white hair and beards hanging over his chin and face, and here he's a stick walking along. Now, there were the Bible said, and I don't think it was for that age because the Scripture said they were both well stricken in age. They were both old. Now, we know if he had lived with her as a wife since she was about 18 years old, and here he was, here she was 90, well, there's absolutely 
Well, it was past the time of having children. Many, many years past time. If she was actually going to have children, she'd have had them back when she was a young woman. And then when it come the time of the change, why, she would have had it before there, or maybe in that time. But now we're 40 years or better past that time. Now, God had to perform some kind of a miracle. All that will agree with that say amen. God had to do something. Now, the first thing, now, I'm a, you're a mixed multitude. And you listen to your doctor. I ought to be as much to you as he. I'm your brother. So now you, I've got to say it this way so you'll thoroughly understand. Now, a woman, he had to put, make her womb fertile. There had to be something happen. That's the reason he said, I'll visit you according to the time of life. Now, if she become to be mother, now, in order to go into labor, she had to have her heart strengthened. An old woman at 90 years old, a woman at 40 today, they die, most of them. And here she is, 90. 90 years old. God had to strengthen her heart. He had to make her womb fertile. And then they didn't have these hygiene bottles as they had today for the babies to nurse, for the cigarette smoking mothers. But in them days, the baby had to nurse normally the mother's milk. And then if she was that old, the milk veins was dried up in her body. He had to make milk veins for it. Certainly he would. You see, you just have to patch her up. God did not patch her up. He was going to show here what he's going to do to every daughter of God. He changed her and made a young woman out of her. And he turned Abraham back to a young man. Now watch and see if this isn't true. I can just imagine, so that the younger will catch it, I can imagine Abraham saying, coming out one morning, and I can hear her say, Why, Abraham, honey, you know that stoop in your shoulders, you're beginning to straighten your shoulders up. That gray hair has begun to turn black. Now I can hear him say back to her, Sweetheart, those black eyes that you used to have, they are turning back again and those wrinkles are leaving your face. Look where they taken a trip from. They was up in Canaan and they took a trip and went all the way to Gerir. That's quite a journey, about 300 miles for an old couple, 100 years old apiece. Journeyed down to Gerir afterwards. And not only that, but there was a young king down there by the name of Amalek. And he was looking for a sweetheart. And he had all those beautiful girls of the Philistines there to pick from. But when he seen grandma coming, he said, that's the one I've been waiting for. Now, wouldn't that sound ridiculous? No, sir. Abraham said, you are fair to look upon. And you say that you're my sister. And I'll be your brother. And Amalek fell in love with Sarah. And would have married her. Ridiculous of try to think. See, that's what all, all of Abraham's seed and his children is going to turn from old back to young. At the coming of the Lord Jesus. Just live true to God. That's his promise. I asked this, a doctor here some time ago. I said, doctor, how, if I was made out of the dust, the earth scientist said I was, made out of 16 different elements of the earth. Then if I was, then why is it, how did I ever become into the form that I am? He said, by eating food. Food turns into blood, blood cells builds you. I said, then, doctor, why is it I'm eating the same kind of food I eat when I was 15 years old? Every time I eat meat, potatoes, bread, every time I eat, I got bigger, stronger, 
and I'm eating the same food now, getting older, weaker. If I'm renewing my life every time I eat, why is it I'm getting old and wrinkled up and eating better food than I did then? And yet, every time I eat, I'm dying. When I eat, then I was living. If you pour a glass of water or take a glass and a jug of water and begin to pour water out of the jug into this glass and it fills halfway full and then keep pouring and more you pour, farther down it goes. Scientifically prove that to me. It can't be. There's no answer for it. But the Bible has the answer. It was appointed unto man. Now, here's what's happened. In the resurrection, when you come forth, you won't come forth a little baby. You'll come forth in your, the splendor of young man and young woman. Now, I want you to get this sincerely. It isn't too long ago, maybe to some of you older people, that you begin to notice that pretty girl that you married turning gray and wrinkling. That young man that you married is turning gray and stooping his shoulders. What's happened? Death set in on you. And it's going to pin you here. Maybe God lets you out. Finally, it's going to take you. But it can't do no harm to you. And when you come forth in the resurrection, you're not going to be one thing there to symbolize sin. You grow. You become at your best between, I think science claims, between 20 and 23, you are at your peak. After that, you start dying. You're living, building till that time. After that, you start going back. God gets a picture up, marries you, puts you together like the first Adam and Eve, and give you a choice. If you can choose Him, you have eternal life. If you do not choose Him, you do not have eternal life. But all that's got eternal life, God will bring with Him at the coming of Christ. And you'll resurrect, not an old man and woman, not a little bitty baby, but you'll resurrect to the perfect young man and young woman of about 22 or 23 years old. You'll be like that forever in the presence of God. That's exactly the truth. That's what he done to Sarah and Abraham. And when Amalek saw that she was beautiful, why well, he fell for her. And she took her to be his wife. Now, I want to kind of pinch just a little bit here, not to hurt bad. But I want you to notice that Amalek, I can imagine when he took this beautiful Hebrew girl and, and put all the jewelry on her and fixed her clothes, while tomorrow he's going to marry her, he went and took his bath and said his prayers and got in bed and stretched out and thought, oh my, tomorrow I'll marry that beautiful Hebrew girl, only 90 years old, see. And uh, he's going to marry her. She probably looked to be about 23. And then when he was laying there thinking that, God came to him and said, you're just as good as a dead man. He said, Lord, why is this? He said, you've got another man's wife. And he said, well, with the integrity of my heart, I did this, Lord. You know she told me that was her brother. And he told me that's the sister. And God said, that's the reason I kept you from sinning against me. I know the integrity of your heart. But listen to this now. I know your integrity, but she is a wife of a prophet. Her husband is my prophet. Now you're talking about somewhere that you think you've done a little something and can't get back to God. Look at Abraham out there, what he had done. Lying about his wife. Sitting out to one side, any man would act like that too about his wife. There he was out there, he was backslid. Certainly God told him, don't leave that country. Stay in Palestine. Any Jew that goes out of Palestine is backslid. God told him, stay in that country. Now, he gave them that country. That's the reason they're returning back now. It's covenant time again. See, Come back to the country. And now he had backslid, went away from God, went down there and told a man that that was his sister instead of his wife. And Hamlet might have been a good holiness man for all I know. But God said, I'll not answer your prayer. But that husband of her is uh, my prophet. And if you don't take him back, his wife, and let him pray for you, you're as good as a dead man. 
What about that? That's God keeping His promise to the seed of Abraham. Oh, my. Can you see? Healing is yours. Salvation is yours. It's a free gift of God that God gave you and called you and chose you before the foundation of the world He chose you. You're His heirs. Why, He watches over you day and night trying to get to you to do something for you. You say, but Brother Branham, I made a mistake last week or last month. I don't care how many mistakes you make. We've all sinned and come short of the glory. If you're a child of Abraham, you're ready to recognize that as sin and come back to God again. And God's mercy still hangs to you. Look at Abraham. said, I won't hear your prayer, Hamley. But every womb was closed up. He said, you take his wife back to him and let him pray for you. Amen. I like that. I'll hear his prayer. For he's my prophet. And he took Sarah and took her back to Abraham and sent her back with gifts. And then Abraham prayed for him. And God opened up the womb of everything he had. And he prospered. And Sarah was a young woman and Abraham was a young man. Notice, after Isaac was born, and Abraham's body being as good as dead, Sarah died at about 137 years old, and Abraham at 145 married another woman and had seven sons besides the daughters. Hallelujah! That's it! He turned them back to a young man. Well, this is nearly another hundred years later. See what he did? He renewed them. That's what he'll do to every covenant person that comes into Christ and dies out to the things of the world and becomes a new creation Creation in Christ, takes on Abraham's seed and her heirs according to the promise. There you are. Then what's divine healing? Did you believe that, brother? From Canada. What's that cancer in the sight of God? To a seed of Abraham. You're feeling around. Trying to find if you... Well, he's right on you. Over you. Under In you. All around you. You can't lay there and live. You must rise in the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm Abraham's son. Because I've accepted Jesus Christ. The promised one. And healing belongs to me. To you people there in those wheelchairs. The same thing. If you are a born-again Christian, the same faith that was in Abraham is in you. And God's promise to Abraham, anything contrary to it, he said, it's though it wasn't. He staggered not to the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong giving praise to God. Every day seemed longer and farther away, but he still praised God and said, it's as though as it's already over with. That's the way to do it. Some of you say, I can't give up the things of the world. I can't do this. I, you can't. You just haven't caught a hold of the right hand yet. That's it. You haven't touched the right garment yet. When you touch him, the high priest of your confession, who is the great seed of Abraham through God's promise, then you take on his spirit. And the fullness of His resurrection power. He fills you and charges you with His goodness and His mercy and His power of faith to call anything that's contrary to God's promises, though it is even there. Don't even look at it. March on. Amen. Well, I just look at we love Susie so much I can't go to prayer meeting on Wednesday night. You get God right down your heart one time, you'll turn that vulgar thing off the radio or television. That's right. Sure you will. All those wise crackers with all them dirty jokes and things, how that uncensored programs on televisions and, and the nation lets it get by with it. Why, it's a disgrace. No wonder we're in the corruption that we're in. And then people who call themselves Christians a miss church to see such stuff. 
I say, uh, Los Angeles, like the rest of America, you need a revival. And the trouble of it is that many times preachers behind the pulpit is so sissified, they're afraid to tell people the truth. It's a meal ticket or they get thrown out. What of it? If you get thrown out, preach it outside somewhere. Keep on going. God's Spirit's eternal. It multiplies and keeps moving. An old man, John Ryan, 70-something years old, a beggar in Fort Wayne, totally blind for 25 years. And in the meeting there that night, when he come to the platform, the Holy Spirit told him who he was and said, Thus saith the Lord, you're healed. And the old fella, he said, Well, I, I don't see. I said, I don't have nothing to do with it. You're healed. If you're a child of Abraham, you take his word first. And here's the angel of the Lord who knows who you are. And all about you, told you, Thus saith the Lord. Well, he just said, what must I do? He was belonged to another denomination of church, Catholic. And he said, uh, what must I do? He used to be a movie star. He also wrote in the ring in Barn and Bailey's great, he was a leader of that great famous garland. Clowning. And he was a great man. Thus saith the Lord. The old fellow got up in the balcony the second night. And I told him, I said, just keep saying, thank you, Lord, for healing me. He said, you think I'll get my sight? I said, you told me you believe what I told you. He said, I do. I said, well, what are you questioning me about then? So he went up and the next night I couldn't hardly preach. He'd say, everybody keep still. Praise the Lord for healing me. Sit back down. About two weeks after the meeting had left Fort Wayne, he sold papers on the street corner. And he was over there selling papers. And another little newsboy led him across to get a shave at the barber shop. And so they put the towel around his neck and lathered his face and little barber wanted to be smart like you know. And he said, say, I heard you was over to see the divine healer when he was up here. He said, yes, I went over. Said, I heard you got healed. Said, yes, praise the Lord, he healed me. And his eyes come open in the barber chair. He jumped out of that chair and down the street he went with that towel under his neck, the barber behind him with a razor in his hand. Down the street he made a, a show. About two months after that, I was going to Benton Harbor to that Jewish colony there called Israel School. And this young rabbi come out to see me. He said, by what authority did you open John's eyes? I said, by the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He said, far be it from God having a son. He was a Jew. And I, I said, and he said that fellow Jesus was nothing but a thief. You know how sometimes Israel can argue. So I, I said, a thief? He said, yes, he stole corn. I said, your own law says a man can go through the field and pluck what he wants to eat, but don't take any out in the sack. How was he a thief? By your own law. And he said, you can never make me believe he was the Son of God. I said, John's got his side, hasn't he? And he said, yes, I've given him many alms on the street. I know he was blind. I said, he can now see. And it was done by his faith in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He said, I don't believe that. I said, well, he's got his sight. We never come here to argue. So there it is. The man standing here. You can't deny it. You can read a newspaper without glasses. And I said, what about that? He said, well, look. Said, he said, you Gentiles can't chop God in three pieces and give him to a Jew. I said, we don't chop him in no three pieces. Not at all. And so then he said, uh, well, I said, would it be hard for you to believe the prophets, Rabbi? He said, I believe the prophets. I said, Isaiah 9 and 6, who was he talking to? Who is he talking about when he said unto us, a child is born, a son is given? Oh, he said, the Messiah. I said, well, then what will Messiah be? He said, he'll be a man. I said, that's what I thought. <laughs> I said, now what requirements, what did he not meet in everything that the Old Testament promised him to be? And you know that fellow, honestly in his heart, I noticed him, he looked around, started to walk away, and tears were running down his beard. And he said, mister, he said, I believe if those temple priests would have believed him, I believe they'd been better off. I said, you believe, Rabbi, that he was the son of God? He said, I believe he was a good man. I had him started. He said... But he wasn't the son of God. And I said, Rabbi, everything he said is coming to pass. 
He said, oh, I believe he was a prophet. I said, if he's a good man, he wouldn't lie. If he's a prophet, he couldn't lie. So there you are. You believe he was the son of God. He turned around and started walking in. He said, if I taught that, he said, I'd be down there in the street oh, over a cliff there. I'd be down there in the street begging. I said, I'd rather be down there in the street begging. I'd rather lay on my stomach and drink branch water and eat soda crackers and have my name on that building up there in gold letters and have to compromise with my own convictions in the Word of God. Absolutely, that's right. God is God. Just the same. There. Then when he brought Sarah back, Abraham back to a young man and woman, she become a mother. They brought the little child. How lovely that little fellow must have been. Eighth day he was circumcised and when he was just a young lad, why, there's a big feast made to him. And one day God said, I'm going to prove so much like this to the ends of this temple that I keep my promise. I'm going to prove to the people that Abraham, you take your only son and take him to a mountain where I'm going to show you. And there you sacrifice him for a burnt offering. Now, he told him he's going to be the father of nations. And here his only son. And now take and destroy and kill the very thing that was going to be, how would make him the father of nations. And I said, you go on and I'll show you the mountain. I can imagine how the old fellow felt. The next morning, his lovely little boy of about 12 years old, how he must have got over, shook him and said, wake up, Isaac. Don't wake up, Mama. Because Mama wouldn't understand. Wake up. He went out there and chopped some wood, clave it, put it in a little sack, put it on the back of a mule and got two servants. Now I remember, he went three days journey back in the wilderness. An ordinary, a man can walk. When I was on patrol for five years, I had to walk 30 miles a day for six days a week. People these days has got what we call gasoline feet. Them days, they, they had to walk, they was more used to it. A man could easily, let's say he just walked 25 miles a day. That made him 75 miles back in the wilderness. And then he lifted up his eyes and saw the mountain far off that the Lord had showed him in the vision where to take the child to offer him. He got close to the mountain. I listened close as we were fixing the clothes. He got close to the mountain. And he said to the servants, you stay here. Think of how his heart must have been beating knowing that he was going up there to kill his son and destroy the only hope he had of ever being the father of nations. But he said he had received him as one from the dead. He was persuaded that God could raise him up from the dead. See that Abraham faith? See what it means? No matter how ridiculous it sounds, if God said it, he means it. He is the way he keeps his word. It's up to him to see it through. Not you to try to see it through. It's him to see it through. Now, listen close. Then he said to the servants, I just love this. He said to these servants, you wait here. The lad and I will go yonder to worship. And the lad and I shall return. How is he going to do it? When he's got the knife and it's sharpened. He's got the fire in his hand. He's got the wood on his back and he took it off his own back and placed it on Isaac a beautiful type of Christ packing that wooden cross up the hill and he said you wait here the lad and I will go yonder to worship and we shall return amen how oh my how are you going to get out of that wheelchair it's none of your business to think about it how are you going to get well it's God's promise only thing you do is keep moving on. And he laid that wood on Isaac's shoulders. And he starts up the hill. And when he got up to the top of the hill, he rolled some rocks together, laid the wood. Little Isaac got suspicious. He said, Father, what's the first word the Bible ever mentioned of Isaac's voice was my father. My father, here is the altar. Here is the fire, here is the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And the trembling old father, not it's just at the last moment, 
He turned to him and he said, My son, God will provide a lamb. Are you Abraham's children? God will provide for himself a sacrifice. Why, it was the last moment. So he reaches under his belt, pulls out the rope, and little Isaac didn't start screaming. He was like, Christ submitted himself to death. Put his son's hands behind him, tied his hands and his feet, laid him up on the altar. Could you imagine how he felt? There's the faith of Abraham. Have you got it? God's able to do this, he said. But this is his commission and this is what I'll carry out. Picked up that home knife, pulled the little curly locks back out of his little 12-year-old boy's face, leaned it back, thinking of Sarah at home. His only son probably kissed him on the cheek, laid him back, looked up, picked up the knife and raised his hand. That's believing God. And as he started to bring the knife down, the Holy Spirit caught his hand. Said, Abraham, Abraham, stay your hand. I know now that you trust me. I know that you love me. Said, you haven't even would spare your own son. And about that time, a lamb bladed behind him. Is a little ram, not a yo now, it was a ram, male, Christ. Had his horns hooked in the vines, right behind him. I want to ask you a question. Where did that ram come from? He was three days' journey from civilization, and up on top of the mountain where there's no water, while the wild beast would have killed the lion. The lions and things would have got the little ram if it had wandered 90 miles back in the wilderness. And then up on top of the mountain another day's journey where there's no water, no grass. If you know the land had been in there, just rocks, that's all. And here was this little ram hooked in the wilderness by its horns. The sagebrush and stuff had it all hooked up by its horns. Where did it come from? Why? No wonder Abraham called it him Jehovah Jireh. What happened? The Lord spoke that lamb into existence. He spoke it in existence one minute and another minute it went out of existence. What is he? He is able. Amen. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's God. It wasn't a vision. The lamb bled. The same God that could pull the elements together and make a body for him to live in and walk up before Abraham, that same God spoke a ram into existence for there was a need for a sacrifice. How's he going to bring you out of that wheelchair? I don't know. That's his business. He's Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. <laughs> what was it? His word was at stake. God will provide. You say, Brother Brennan, I'm eat up with cancer. That hasn't got one thing to do with it. The doctor says I can't live but it's six months longer. My heart's so bad. The valves have stopped. I don't care what they've done. He's still Jehovah Jireh. He made that heart. What was it? He was Christ. That ram represented Christ. Jehovah Jireh has already provided a sacrifice for you. And then he said, Abraham, Abraham, all nations will be blessed by you. My covenant is sure to you. Why? Abraham loved him. Abraham took his word. And if we are the children of Abraham, God has fulfilled his promise as we had the other night at the day of Pentecost of the day of the sacrifice when he tore the life out of Christ and tucked the body up and sent the Holy Spirit back here and night after night year after year he proves himself a living among us the healer 
to Abraham's children, whosoever will believe. You might have done evil. You might have been adulterous. You might be a gambler. You might be anything that there could be in sin. No matter how deep you have stooped, he's Jehovah Jireh. His sacrifice is provided. His presence is here. He keeps his word. He's here now to save, to heal, to perform anything that he promised because he's already made the sacrifice and accepted it. And all we do is to look and live. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide his self a sacrifice. He has provided a sacrifice for us. You are sick. Your duty is to go to your doctor. If your doctor cannot help you, then God has a sacrifice provided. If you're an alcoholic, you went to the synonymous. And you've probably tried to get cured that way. If you're a cigarette smoker, you've probably taken a note back and everything that you could think of. And still you crave them things. You come to the end of the road. With that, with them unclean habits, you can't be of God. And if you've done everything that you can do, and still you see that it doesn't work, then Jehovah has a provided sacrifice. He's Jehovah Jireh, the sacrifice to take you away from your sins. You say, Brother Brenham, I've sought for the Holy Spirit. I've did this. You never do that. The Holy Spirit seeks you. You don't seek the Holy Spirit. It's seeking you. It's just your surrender to it. That's what does it. Brother Branham, I've sought divine healing. Divine healing was purchased at Calvary. You don't seek divine healing. The, the divine healer seeks you. God. That's why you're here tonight. He's trying to get into your heart. Jesus, the Son of God. He's in the building. His Spirit is here. Jehovah Jireh has provided a sacrifice. And... Lord. Mm. If I understand the scriptures right, the Holy Spirit speaking, how reverently I heard talking of healing there. I'd be real reverent while the Holy Spirit is moving. Now, everybody quietly pray. I don't think there's any prayer cards given out. There's no cards in the building, is there? No, all building are. Right. But that same God that was over there on the day of Pentecost, that same God that... Thank you, Father. We thank you for these promises and how that your children, maybe not of, of just going out and doing evil, 
But the sin I would believe that you were saying for them to confess is the sin of superstition or unbelief. I pray that that you will grant unto these people tonight that they are present here now to to know that these people are are charged with thy spirit and they have delivered that amount of messages three messages you said let it be by the course of three and we've had those three messages immediately after the teaching of the scripture now father we thank you for that we pray that that'll sink deep into the hearts of the people and now let thy holy spirit convince and convict sinners of their sin that they might come to thee we are waiting on thee in the name of the lord jesus as you're praying just keep praying the bible said that jesus is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities now he is that high priest and a woman touched his garment he turned around now you don't touch me this is just a gift you touch him and see if he doesn't know your trouble has there been anybody in divine presence now that has never been in one of my meetings would you raise your hand right easily just a few not over two dozen i get all right we while they're praying be real reverent now don't know one move just sit real still i'm a total stranger to these people but that you might know that the words that i have said and been talking these several nights that we're at the end time the last sign to the church is that sign that jesus gave to the jews at the ending of their dispensation gave to the samaritans at the ending of their dispensation but never give it to the gentiles then spoke that in the last days that sign would come back again just at the burning of the world like it did at sodom gomorra and the man who was had god's spirit in him turned his back and asked abraham where sarah was asked why did she laugh in the tent when she laughed within herself never made any noise jesus said so much that will take place again at the end of the gentile age i'll be reverent and pray i want to try to come across the audience to all everywhere if i can just to see if the holy spirit will reveal I don't know one move just be real reverent keep praying just don't think about me standing here but just say to the lord like this now i do not know a person as far as i can see this minister sitting right here in front of me i can't think of his name i shook his hand just now i can remember of meeting him but i don't know just what his name was it's the only person in the building that i know of and i've got some friends here i know the stadscliff chaplain stadscliff he's here somewhere and then i think brother softman and some friends from canada outside of that with my own son and my daughter and am is the only ones i know if he should speak to one of them i'll call her who they were just pray if you're sick how many in the building maybe there's no sickness here if anybody in here is suffering and you believe that you have faith enough to touch the high priest now just slip up your hand real quietly like that oh yes there's plenty of sickness it's just everywhere all right now it's it's ruled in the bible you know that it's god's promise now will it work if it works then i've told the truth now, i've spoke of god now if he speaks of me i know i've told the truth about him now he may not speak of this i don't know if he does all right if he doesn't well still that's that's all right anyhow we'll just ask and see if he will speak to us uh go we'll look to my left just concentrate on that side if you'd raise your head just a moment right straight through here a lady sitting praying has got sinus trouble do you believe the lord jesus will heal you sister all right the gray-headed lady that bowed her head right raise up your hand back early that's it god bless you now just believe with all your heart now now somewhere out in here i can't see where the boy is at but there's a young there's a boy man young fella it's a uh, he's praying he's a spanish boy 
Can anyone speak Spanish here? Raise up your hand. You, sir? All right, there you are. Liver trouble. That's right. Speak to him. All right. All right. Liver trouble. Will you believe? Benny? Benny back there I'm speaking to. That's his name. Raise your hand if that's true. It's over now. Say, tell him this. Tell him he's from San Diego. He isn't from Los Angeles. That's right. He can go back home now. He's going to get over that. Now, the boy was on the floor somewhere. I couldn't see him, but I could see him stand up here, and it's in his back. I seen the examination in his back, and I seen him warbling something. I know he couldn't speak English. If the mother there or any of them understands, he doesn't know any English, not one English. If that isn't the Holy Spirit, what is? What about somebody else that you want to believe? Do you believe? I have faith. Somebody in this direction. If you can believe... A lady sitting right in here. A man sitting there. It must be him praying or the lady. It's got sinus trouble. And no, no, it's nervousness. Real nervous. I see something making him nervous. If you'll believe. Mrs. Myers is who I'm speaking to. Do you believe that the Lord Jesus will make it well? If you believe it, you can have it. All right. You believe, Miss Myers? Stand up on your feet so the people will see. I don't know. You have never seen you. Is that right? Raise your hand. If we're strangers, one another, raise up your hand. Been extremely nervous. But there's something happened to you. You believe this to be the truth, don't you? That's the reason you're healed. Now you can go home. You're going to be well. If thou canst believe. Just don't doubt. Have faith in God. You believe it can be done from my back turned to you? Just like the angel of the Lord that came. Now, it's him, not me. You pray. Somebody in this section. Just pray and let me pray and look this way. Lord God, let it happen, Lord, that the people might know that it's not your servant. It's, it's you, Lord. It's to fulfill your promise. You promised to Jesus. And we believe that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let it happen, Lord. There's a lady praying back here she has complications trouble with her eyes her name is Mrs. Code Colleen Code stand up Mrs. Code Jesus Christ makes you well sister I do not know you is that right raise your hand if that's true if we're strangers have faith You believe God's still God? Certainly he is. Just only believe. Lord, could it happen again? I pray that you'll grant it. Must be in this dire direction. I see a woman. A vision of a woman. She's... No, she's behind me. And the woman's suffering with arthritis and troubles. Sis, her name would be Ruth Myers. If you believe, you can be made well. Stand up wherever where you are. Mrs. Ruth Myers, the Lord bless you. Right out from you there sits a lady that's suffering with varicose veins. If you believe also, lady, while the Spirit... It's got a big hat on. It, raise up your hand, lady. All right. Now, you can go home and be well, too. Jesus Christ makes you well. Do you believe on the Lord Jesus? How many believes now with all your heart? See? See? Look, friends. That could just keep going on now. We don't, I don't want to weaken myself. I want to put everything I got in Saturday and Sunday's meetings... Just that you might see, there's not one prayer card in the building. These people, ever who was called, I couldn't a bit more tell you now than nothing. 
see? And I'm having to keep watching both sides of the building like that to keep seeing them visions coming because the anointing is on me. And that's not me. That's your faith believing what I've preached to be the truth. See? Now, that's God here. Now, pl- try to, one time, see? Try to realize how great that is. See that it's God's promise. He said that would happen right here amongst the Gentile people. If God did that at the ending of each generation or each uh, time, and he doesn't do it here at this time, then he did wrong back there. He let them have something that we didn't have. But he promised this would be it just before the destruction time. Here's the angel of the Lord. I, I don't, I'm a grammar school student, just barely made the seventh grade. You know, by my talk, I, I have no education. Uh, but God probably had it that way. He gave me something else to work by. You can tell by my preaching, I'm not even a preacher. Well, I can't have no education. I don't know much about scriptures and how a theologian. I, I'm not a theologian. Uh, just what I know, I like to express it. But God gave me something else to manifest him by. Now, it's strange that it doesn't do too much good in America. When in Africa, India, Australia, let that happen in thousands times, thousands of crying, run to the altar and repent. And, but here, it doesn't seem to go. Why is it, friends? Are we at the end of the road? Are, are, we are at the end of the road. Remember, I'm saying that with my Bible over my heart, with the Spirit who knows your heart and knows all things. And now I can't do that at my own leisure. He is the one who reveals it to me. See? And I couldn't do it. It's your faith that's a doing it. The, it was, Jesus didn't know what was married to the woman. He said, who touched me? Somebody touched him. And he kept looking around till he found it. And he said it made him weak. How many knows that's a scripture? Does the Bible say Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Then that's him. If he's the same, he's got to be the same in principle, same in power, same in attitude. You might have heard lots in your life, friends. But let's remember, as thus saith the Lord. You're sitting under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Remember, thus saith the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, after three nights of trying in my poor, illiterate ways that I have, being an illiterate person, and I've tried with all my heart, Lord, to explain that you are the, still the great Jehovah. And your goodness and mercy to come down and confirm that, that I have told the truth that we're at the end time. Lord, please don't let any person that's in divine presence ever have to suffer, suffer the, the separation from God, eternal separation, to go into a devil's hell. That's prepared not for them, but for the devil. May they now, in the presence of the Holy Ghost, not take a choice to continue on and go to the devil's hell, but may they come to God's heaven where all things are made ready and waiting for them. Their invitation now is the Holy Spirit speaking to their hearts. Let them come, Lord, and confess the, and confess their unbelief and ask you for mercy. Then heal the sick and afflicted that's in our midst. May this be a great time just now, for all things are ready. The word has been preached, the songs has been sung, and the Holy Spirit has confirmed his presence. Lord, let those who are needy tonight reach up by faith and receive Christ for what they have need of. We ask it in Jesus' name because we believe that they are the children of Abraham that has been kind of tossed about, Father. The people seem to hardly know what to do. They're like sheep that strayed out from away from the shepherds. We pray, God, that tonight, regardless of their denomination or affiliation of church, may they come to the shepherd of life, Jesus Christ, who is present now and proves that he's present. May they come, for we ask it in his name. While we have our heads bowed, how many on this bottom floor here will be honest within your heart that for just the next five minutes, we will you raise your hands and say, Brother Branham, I, I need Christ, spiritually speaking. I need Christ in my life. And I want him to give to me the faith and make me Abraham's seed. Would you raise your hand on the bottom floor? Just put your hands way up. Now, hold them up for a while. Surely in the presence of the Holy Ghost, you'd not be ashamed to do it. God bless you. There's dozens of hands up on the bottom floor. Now, you say, does that mean anything, Brother Branham, if I put up my hand? 
the difference between death and life, if you mean it. You say, what does that do? That shows supernatural power when you raise your hand. Science says your hand has to hang down. Gravitation holds your hand down. But there's a spirit here talking to your spirit that tells you that you're wrong. And you break the laws of gravitation when you raise your hand, showing that there's something in you that's made a decision. And you break the laws of gravitation when you raise your hand, because according to science, they have to hang down. Gravitation holds them down. But a spirit in you making the decision upon your maker holds your hand up. Now, in the balconies up there, be honest. Just tomorrow night's the great healing service is starting. I want you to raise your hand and say, Brother Branham, by this I raise my hand to God. I realize I need him. My faith isn't sufficient. I, I don't maybe don't live right or something like that. Raise your hand to him. Will you do it? How many will do that? Just raise up your hand. Brother Duffield, I want to show you something. Keep your heads bowed just a minute, please. Do you notice the people that's close to here is the one who gets mm -hmm. yes. Did you notice that? Oh, yes. Okay. See, that farther down. Yes. Up there, it goes completely out. See, it just fades out. Isn't that strange? But it's working of the Spirit. See, closer brings it like when it comes to the platform. Just something I wanted to show the pastor here that I've been talking about just so you could see it confirmed. Now... How many is sick and needy, really needy, and you want God to heal your body, raise up your hand. You're sick and needy. God bless you. Up in the balconies, everywhere. Now, will you believe me while the, if, if I found grace in, in your side by the preaching of the gospel, and if the Holy Spirit has come back and spoke through me showing that I've told the truth that's God speaking that I've told the truth remember each one of you that's sick Jesus healed you 1900 years ago when he died at Calvary he was wounded for your transgressions with his stripes you were healed right then see now if you're children of Abraham believe that promise it's yours might not happen just at this minute might not happen in the morning it's got to happen. It never happened for Abraham for 25 years. But it did happen. But if Abraham would ever give down, it wouldn't have happened. But you've got to hold on. See, to God. Just take a hold of it tonight by faith and believe it. And every one of you will be made well. Do you believe God would hear my prayer? Say amen if you do. All right. Now, as my, my loving people, the jewels that will being the crown if I have any the people that love me and I love you and these nights where I've been speaking real deep and cutting I don't mean to hurt anyone but I'm trying to, to shake you hard enough just so you can see what I'm talking about see I'm, I want you to realize that you're in the presence of the Holy Spirit not a man I have nothing to do with it just, he'd have, if he didn't use my lips he'd use his didn't use my eyes he'd use somebody else's See, somebody's got to represent it because he promised it do you understand? say amen then it's his goodness now you do as I tell you and don't you doubt one bit all that it that believe in all your heart that through Jesus Christ, your life being dead and hidden Him, that you are seeds of Abraham, all you sick people, say amen. amen. Then if you're Abraham's seed, you have Abraham's faith. Is that right? Say amen. amen. Now you listen then to me as God's servant. Now, the Bible said, these signs shall follow them that believe. If they, how many believers first? Raise your hands, believers. Now look, them's believers. Now what did the Bible say about that? Now if God keeps this promise, how much more mysterious is this promise than that one? How much more farther up into the kingdom is this promise to make known the secret of the heart? Now, did you hear those people speaking in tongues a while ago? Now Paul said that was to be done. Keep quiet and see what it says. Let it be by the courses of three. That's just what there was, three. All right? Now, he said, then, if one speak and no one interprets, said so forth, and he loud tongues, but he said, if there be one prophet that prophesies and makes known the secret of the heart, then they'll all fall down and say, God is in your midst. Is that true? Is that the scripture? 
Well, see, that's the spirit that was in the early church. Is here in the Angelus Temple right now. That same spirit that hovered over Paul and them when they were teaching is right here now doing the very same thing, keeping the very same promises of Christ. And that same spirit made this promise. These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Is that what he said? Now, all you people as believers, lay your hands over on one another. See, just lay your hands on somebody near you. Now, so that there'll be no selfishness, don't pray for yourself. You pray for one another. You know who that is sitting there by you that's got their hands on you? That's one of Abraham's seed. God's chosen children. Abraham's son or Abraham's daughter has their hands on you. Now, you thank God in your heart for the promise of His healing. See? They've got their hands on you. These signs shall follow them that believe. They've got their hands on you. They're Abraham's seed. You're healed. That's all. So you thank God that Abraham's children prayed for you. If you'd let yourself just go into that spirit now, don't be afraid. It won't hurt you. It'll save you. It'll, it'll heal you. Let's let yourself give right into that spirit one time in your life. Just let it give right in. Just like he's receiving the Holy Ghost. Watch what takes place. The lame will walk. The blind will sing. Lord God, in who we trust and believe, we believe that the Holy Spirit now is coming into every heart that's in divine presence. As your servant, I condemn every sickness that the devil has put on these children of God. Satan, you're defeated. We defeat you through the name of Jesus Christ. Come out, I adjure thee by the living God to move from this audience away from these people and let every one of them be healed just now as they're praying. Lord, they have their hands on one another. They're Abraham's children, and they're praying one for the other. Oh, Lord, let the Holy Ghost so baptize this audience just now with the power of His presence till they'll completely forget about their sicknesses and diseases and will be made well. Grant it, Lord. They're yours. They're the trophies of your grace and your promise. They believe you. In the name of Jesus Christ, may it be so. What did he say? Only believe. Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. What do you think now? All right? Amen. Take your cotton, go home, man. Oh, what do you think over here? Bleeding? You? All oh, things are possible. Oh, maybe. One March morning. The wind was a blowing. A man rushed up to Jesus. He said, I took my children, my child, to your disciples. Ten days before that, Jesus gave them power to heal all kinds of sickness, all kinds of diseases. And they was down there crying and shouting and everything. But they couldn't cast this epileptic spirit out. The boy still had it. Yet they'd be given power. Now, you Presbyterians, you got the power. You Baptists, you got the power. But it's laying dormant because you're afraid to use it. See, that's why they had power, but they couldn't do it. And every one of these got power. These crippled people's got power right now to rise up there and walk. This dying man with cancer has got power to raise up and walk. The rest of you all that are sick. You got power. You got power. It's given to you. You shall receive power. That's what the Bible said. And this man said, I brought him to him. The disciples, they couldn't cure him. Said, Lord, if you can't help me, Jesus said, I can if you believe. For all things are possible to them that believe. What more could God do to make us believe? We believe. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I do declare this by the Word of God that every person that desires to be healed right now, if you'll accept it after hands has been laid on you, by these men's, 
women, sons and daughters of Abraham, you can rise up and be made well, for you're healed according to God's promise and word. You are well. Your diseases are done. Now, do you believe it? Stand up on your feet and accept it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's right. All right. God bless you. Pastor.